one of the California surfers who rides the nose exceptionally well. What's up, Freedom Church? What's up, Freedom Church? Anybody excited for a Sunday where you know that God's presence dwells, is inhabited, is throned by the praises of his people? Psalms 22 says that where God's people worship, he resides. Anybody grateful to know that God is in the house this morning? My name is Justice, if we haven't met, and um, uh, we're, we're going to get into part three of our series, Imagine More. Before we kind of jump into that, though, I want to tell you next week is going to be a really big deal. Will you turn to the person next to you and say, next Sunday? My boy Mark Clark is going to be here. Mark, uh, Pastor Mark pastors, I think the largest church in Canada. And uh, he's going to be in town, and he's going to preach at all of our services. He wrote an incredible book called The Problem of God. Check out this tagline, Answers a Skeptic's Challenges to Christianity. So if you um, are a skeptic, we're glad you're here. Um, Jesus loves skeptics. If you have a friend who is uh, maybe too smart for their own good, bring them, right? If you may be, uh, I don't know, uh, if you're a smarty pants yourself, show up. I love this book because it's the book I'm able to give to my friends who are wrestling with tough questions, and I'm able to look to this book a number of times to kind of bring some clarity about some of the things about who God is and some of the tough, uh, the, first, the first chapters about science and faith. It blew my mind, and it continues to work its way through 10 chapters, and I just want you to know next week is going to be a week that you don't want to miss. Mark's going to be here, and uh, it's going to be incredible. We'll have the book for sale, but we're going to get to hear from Pastor Mark Clark, so make sure you tell your friends. Okay, let's jump into our, uh, our, our, our text that kind of frames the Imagine More series. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, that is what the scriptures mean when they say, now let's read it together with enthusiasm. One, two, three. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I have a seven-year-old son, and a number of years ago, I don't know, baby, how old do you think Logan was? You think he was, was he six? Was he five? We were walking through Barnes and Noble, and uh, he found uh, this incredible study resource that I've since leaned on uh, to glean uh, the ancient complexities of the text. Uh, the Brick Bible comes in two testaments, um, as appropriate. We got a New Testament and we got an Old Testament. And as you can see, it's a, a, it's a book of the Bible illustrated with Lego characters. Now. Um, my son's like, hey, will you get this Bible for me? And I was like, absolutely. I should have noticed that it says the brick Bible, not the Lego Bible, and realize that this is a pirated piece of junk. But I didn't. So I, I picked this resource up, and I was like, sure, son, I'll read it to you. How, how, I mean, how, how bad could it? I mean, maybe this would be a good. So I climb up on the bunk bed to read the uh, the Brick Bible to my son, bedtime stories. Mind you, this is right before we go to bed. So we go for the, the New Testament copy, open it right up. Let's see what the book Bible has to offer. Open it up, and it's Revelation with dragons and people dying and catching on fire. And I was like, son, I'm sorry, close your eyes. This should have had a rated R warning label on the front of it. It was rough. And uh, <laughs> it gave him nightmares. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I realized that the Bible in its stories have challenges to illustrate, especially not just Revelation, but the Old Testament. You ever read the Old Testament and wonder like, hey, is, is there an Old Testament version of God and like a New Testament version of God? Is there like, is God like in a bad mood in the Old Testament? And then he's like a progressive, liberal, Prius driving, Berkeley educated <laughs> uh, <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, to Joshua chapter 6, and we're going to pick up where we left off in the story of Joshua leading people into the promised land. We've been journeying on this story for a number of weeks, and I thought it only appropriate to read the Brick Bible version of this. It's going to be wild, guys. Are you ready? It's going to be wild. I'm going to read, and we're going to move slowly through this as illustrated in the Brick Bible. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Jericho shut itself tightly because of the Israelites, with no one in, allowed in or out. Let's get that first picture of, there we go. <laughs> Verse 2, 
Next slide. Then Yahweh said to Joshua, march all your soldiers around the city once per day for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horns in front of the ark. That's the Lord there on the left, this Merlin looking dude <laughs> with the angry face. That's exactly what I was afraid God was going to look like when I prayed to him. Look at this. Joshua 6, verse 4. On the seventh day, next slide, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. Then the whole army must utter a mighty war cry. Next slide, verse 5. Then the city walls will collapse and all the men can charge straight in. Verse 11. So Joshua got up early the next morning and had the ark go around the city with seven priests blowing their trumpets and soldiers marching in front and in the back of the ark. Verse 14. Then they went back to the camp. Verse 14, then they did this for six days. Verse 15, on the seventh day, they circled the city seven times. Verse 16, then Joshua told the army, the city and everyone in it must be offered to Yahweh under the curse of destruction. Only spare Rahab the prostitute and those in her house. You remember the story of Rahab? Joshua 6, verse 18. Next slide. Do not take anything under the curse of destruction, or you will put Israel under the same curse and bring disaster. Verse 19. All items of silver, gold, bronze, and iron belong to Yahweh, which is the name for God, and must go into his treasury. Raise the war cry, for Yahweh has given you the city. Joshua 6, verse 20. The trumpet sounded, and the army gave a mighty war cry, and the walls collapsed. And I, I think I would just like to stop right there. Anybody else? Let's just stop right there. Let's just celebrate, you know, that Jesus has, has fought the victory and he has won, okay? That God has, God has done his thing and that they didn't even have to do anything. They just walked around these walls and they just came a-tumbling down. Do you know the song? It's just a good moment to celebrate. <laughs> now, the author of the Brick Bible felt compelled over the next few verses to stretch out Joshua verse chapter 6, verse 21, through six different slides. The trumpet sounded, and the army gave a mighty war cry, and the walls collapsed. Now, for the next six slides, this is actually just one verse. He felt like he needed to illustrate this six different ways. The men charged straight into the city to destroy every living thing in it. The men. The women. <laughs> the young. The old. Appropriate. <laughs> the cattle. The sheep. And the donkeys. The two spies went and brought Rahab and her family, the prostitute, to a place outside Israel. I think Rahab might be Princess Leia from the Lego set. I'm not sure. And why she has a floating head, I'm not sure. Then Israel burned the whole city and everything in it. And no doubt that was a look on their face. Will you bow your head? Would you close your eyes with me? Lord, we don't want to underestimate the simple prayer. God, help us. When we say God, help us, we are speaking and declaring that not only do we need your help this morning, but you are the one who gives help. 
You're the one who gives us understanding. You're the one who leads us to all truth. You're the heart that we're seeking after. It's your will that we're searching. You're the one we want to know. So God, will you help us? We didn't come here this morning for a history lesson. We didn't come here this morning for a date, a, a debate about Old Testament religious texts. We came here this morning, and you can actually make this decision right now if you want. You can reassign the reason why you're here right now. We came here this morning because we want to know you. We, we, we want to know you. If we leave and we don't know you more, this was a waste of time. We believe that the living God is here and that you have something that you want to reveal to us about your love. Lord, we believe that this doesn't have to be a waste of time because we submit and surrender our hearts to you and we invite you, O oh Heavenly Father, to have your way in our heart. So we ask for your help, God. This is tough to, to discuss. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're a decent human being, you probably have at least three questions going on. One, how about this one? What is God like? Is that what God's like? That's a good one. The second question, and we'll get there. Uh, if that's what God's like, well, what about Jesus? How do you reconcile the Old Testament depictions and portraits of a violent God with the suffering servant and sacrifice of Jesus, who is God? What is God like? What about Jesus? And then lastly, why on earth are you even teaching this today, Pastor Justice? What does this have to do with my life? How does this story impact our life today? Let's start with the first question. What is God like? Well, when we lean on Scripture to reveal who God says He is, and we see this in the stories of the texts and passages of God, we see that God has actually answered that question a number of ways, but one time He answered that question in person by describing Himself. We see uh, just a few chapters before this, just a few years before this, Moses trained Joshua, and Moses had a really dynamic relationship with God. He had a relationship with God that he was even, uh, it was unlike Abraham, it was unlike anybody. And Moses encountered God on a mountain with a burning, flaming bush. You remember that story? And God actually tells Moses to some degree what he's like, because Moses says, who do I say sent me when I go on this mission and I deliver these people from captivity in Egypt? Who do I say sent me? What's your name? Who, what are you? And God says, I am. Tell him, I am sent you. In Hebrew, the probably best way to translate I am would be, I am who I say I am, and that's who I'm going to be. That's, that's probably the best way to say it. Moses is like, okay, well, if I'm going to do this, tell me who you are. And he goes, I am. And so I guess that was enough for Moses. And he follows through, and we read the incredible story of the Exodus and God's deliverance and his care for his people. And then years later, we see that that's not the only encounter that Moses has with God. That actually, they begin, believe it or not, starts like a burning bush, but it kind of turns into a relationship. And you see Moses and God having conversations. And you see him encountering on a mountaintop. And you see him at the tent of meeting. And you see conversations and discussion and dialogue. And it's almost like that Moses and God are, have this companion kind of element to him. And Moses asks all sorts of questions. And at one point, Moses is told by God. He says, God says, I'm pleased with you. And Moses goes, well, if you're pleased with me, then tell me who you are. Don't, not just I am. Tell me who you are. If you were to ask me, you know, what my, my wife is like, you know, Maria, we've been married, I think, 12 years, we've been together 12, 13 years, what she's like, I w you see how I answered that? I said, I've been married 12 years, we've been together. See, I don't really know, so I'm just like, we've been together 12 years, I've been married 12 years, and, you know, we know her. <laughs> I could answer that question a number of different ways, right? If you said, you know, well, what's Maria like? And I was like, well, she's five foot three, brown hair. Um, kind of got a little J-Lo thing going on. I don't know. 
but sexier? <laughs> if, I, if you asked me what's Maria like and I gave you that answer, would that be really the answer you're looking for? No, because you could say, what is God like? You could say, tell me what Maria is like, and I could describe, but it's not answering the question. No, tell me what she's like. Tell me what she's like. Tell me her character. Tell me what she's like. Don't tell me, don't describe her, but we do that with God so often. Tell me what God's like, and we jump into what I call the omnis. Well, he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's, um, you know, we just go straight into describing the character of an almighty, all-powerful, you know, all-present, all-knowing. We just go right into all who he is. But that's not what God is like, but it is what God is like. You know what I'm saying? We jump into describing what God is like without actually telling what God is like. Moses goes, tell me what you're like. God says, I am. And he tells him again, listen, tell me who you are. In fact, he says, show me your glory. He says, show me. If you were to say, tell me what Maria was like, and I just described what she looked like, that wouldn't be what you're looking for. I would say, let me tell you about Maria. Maria is incredibly kind. She is so kind, it leaves me scratching my head half the days of the week, because somehow she's able to see other people before she sees herself, something that I haven't learned how to do quite yet. Maria is so funny, but not in the funny way that's just like, you know, funny like we can laugh at any sitcom on TV. The kind of funny that makes jokes in between the jokes on the sitcom on TV because she's so smart and she's so witty. She tells me jokes and says things that catch me by surprise and they get me laughing from my gut because she's hilarious. Maria, she's, the way she develops our kids and parents our kids, she's not messing around. She's so intentional with the way she's forming them and shaping them. It's just every time I turn around, she's used as an opportunity to, to teach our kids something and help them know how much God loves them and how to be better human beings. Uh, M Maria is a great kisser. <laughs> I could tell you the different things about who Maria is. When you say, tell me about Maria, I could tell you what she's like, or I could tell you what she's like. And Moses says, Don't you, who is God? Okay, you are who you are, and you, that's who you're going to be. Great. Come on, we know each other a little bit better now. Tell me what you're really like. And Moses gets this incredible, astounding, mind-blowing visitation from God, not as a burning bush, but as a, as a presence as a being. And it says that Moses, God goes, okay, fine, I'll tell you what I'm like, but I got to hide you in the cleft of this rock. Have you heard this story? And I have to put my hand over your eyes to shield you because you can't see all of me. You can only see a glimpse of me, right? I'm going to walk before you. You're only going to see, you know, the behind glory. You're only going to see this. And Moses goes, I'll take it. And so in verse 34, excuse me, in Exodus 34, in verse 5, we get to see how God you're going to ask the question, what God is like? Let's read about how God describes himself. Let's read how God describes himself for the first time in the Bible. He says this. Then the Lord came down in a cloud, and he stood there with them, and he proclaimed his name, the Lord. Which in your Bible is all caps, but it's the word Yahweh. So Moses is learning that beyond the title of I am, he is Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh. The compassionate and gracious God who is slow to anger. Would anybody agree the God you've gotten to know is compassionate? He's gracious. Would anybody say that he's slow to anger? He's more patient with you and with me than we deserve? God says, let me tell you what I'm like. I'm compassionate. I'm gracious. I'm slow to anger. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Would anybody agree? Maintaining love to the thousand and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. What is God like? He says, well, let's start with compassion or chesed in the Hebrew. Let's start with unfailing loving kindness, compassion, grace, patience, slow to anger, incredibly merciful, yet... Yet, here we go, does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents for the third and the fourth generation. Oh, there he is. There it goes. You know, see, some of you are like, oh, I could, I, there's a catch. <laughs> there's a catch to this God. Is there? Let me ask you. Do you, do you really want a God? Do you really want a God who isn't just? I, mean, I don't know how you're thinking about it right now. You're maybe thinking about your own sin and guilt, which is appropriate. 
I mean, do you really want a God who is sovereign but not just? He lets people murder somebody that you love and get away with it forever? Do you want to, do you worship that God? Do you want a God that, where people are, excuse me for being graphic, but raped or molested, something has been taken from you, you feel like your soul's been tarnished, you feel like you're never going to be the same again? Do you really want to worship a God who lets that off the hook forever? Doesn't have an answer for that? Do you really want the guilty to go unpunished? Do you, do you really want a God who is sovereign and all-powerful, but just isn't just and never has the last say and never makes it right? Or do you want to believe in a God? Do you, do you believe in a God? Can you see a God that is not only compassionate and gracious and slow, 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 slow to anger, incredibly merciful, but at the end of the day, he is just because the best is yet to come. Because he does imagine a world that is without sin and the consequences of sin and the ramifications of these anti-God-like attributes. Do you worship God for who he is? Or if I can ask you this morning, do you worship God for who you want him to be? You see, you and I were not made. Can I pastor you for a second? We, were not, we did not make God in our image. He made us in his image. <laughs> I read one quote that says, God made man in his image, and like the gentleman that man is, he returned the favor. <laughs> we turn around and we ascribe to God who we think he should be, but we don't get to judge God. That's not how that works. You can, you can do that. You can make up your own God, okay, and let that, God, you can make up that, you can, you can let your own feelings and version of God inform who you think God should be. And then you can paint a portrait of who that God is. I'll tell you what, that God's going to have no power in your life and you're going to get really bored with him really quick. There is a God who is who he says he is. He's compassionate. Would you agree? He's gracious, would you agree? He's loving to the thousands upon thousands. But at the end of the day, the best thing about God is that he is just. What is God like? Well, he's compassionate and he's just. So what about Jesus? Keeping in mind that we opened up this talk with this Old Testament illustration, what about Jesus? Where's Jesus and all that? Because we have 2,500 years later, Jesus steps into human history and Jesus begins to say things that sound in completely different than what they had read in their scriptures, his original audience. And what Jesus says in Matthew 5, now this is the big sermon by Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount, and people all around the world have clung to this for hope and for an understanding of the gospel. And in fact, I, I read that Mahat Gandhi actually carried around, though he wasn't a believer, he carried around every day of his life an actual, the actual writing of this this sermon, he, he carried this around, not professing that Jesus is Lord, but imagining that this really could be what the world looked like. This is what Jesus said, gathering thousands of people. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Try telling Joshua and the Canaanites that one. Blessed are the meek, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed, here we go, my favorite one, are the peacemakers, for they'll be called sons and daughters of God. They'll be called children of God. Peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, I will have the last say. He goes on to say in the same sermon in verse 38, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What, do you, what does Jesus mean, you have heard it said? He means you have heard it said in the Old Testament that an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth is what a just God looks like, is what justice looks like. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus says, you've heard it said that, but I'm here to introduce something else. I'm here to take it to another level. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Really, Jesus? 
And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Really? If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He says it again. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You've heard it said, love your tribe. Take care of your tribe and leave them to off to themselves. You love your neighbor, you hate your enemy. But Jesus says, I'm introducing a new tribe. Spoiler alert, the church. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus just took this thing and took it to another standard. He's like, you know what? While you're at it, just be perfect. You'll be fine. The word perfect there is actually mean just mature the way your heavenly Father is matured. He says if you continue growing in with these things that, that we just discussed in this sermon, you will wind up looking like God. And that will change the world. And what does God look like? Well, God looks like compassion and mercy and love and grace and blessing and unfailing, patient, unbelievable love. But God also looks like Jesus. You see, Jesus steps into human history to say, have you ever wondered what God looks like? Well, I'm here. This is what God looks like. Would you agree that Jesus is compassionate? Would you agree that he's full of grace and full of truth? Would you agree that he is, would you agree that he is who God says he is? C.S. Lewis says that Jesus is what God had to say and all of what God had to say, Jesus. There is nothing, I'll say it this way, like God that is not like Jesus, and there's nothing like Jesus that is not like God. God is Christ-like, and God is Christ. Some of you, your mind is like, right now. I thought Jesus was God's son. Yes, he is. He is God's son. Fully God. How, what is God like? Well, look no further than Jesus. Jesus steps in and he says, you want to know what this looks like? You see, what happens is we look at the Old Testament, we look at the Bible for that matter, and we read it like it's a cookbook, right? Like if, if, if you, you have a, anybody have a cookbook? Probably not. You probably have a cookbook app or something like that, right? But if you had a cookbook and you went to it, no matter how big or how old the cookbook is, you could take a page out, go get those ingredients, cook something up, and as long as you got the original ingredients in the cookbook, you're going to have something that tastes like you pretty much predicted it was going to taste, right? As long as you have the original, it could, that, 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 that recipe could be a thousand years old, but if you can get the same ingredients, it's going to produce the same results. We look at the Bible like it's a cookbook. We look at the Bible like we could just go take any page out of the Bible and be like, see what God is like? You see what, you see what he wants us to do? And if you've read Leviticus, you're going to be in a big, you're going to be in big trouble. Yeah, I, best, I, best, I guess I better cut the head off this pigeon and just dump all this blood all over my sacrifice because then God will smell it like an aroma and he'll be happy with me. God, didn't, God, did not in, God did not invent a sacrificial system for a tribal mentality. There were tribes that understood sacrifices and God said, oh, I'll step into that so you can understand me. I'll meet you where you are. Does that make sense? See, the Bible isn't a cookbook. It's a progressive revelation of who God is and his story of his people, ultimately a progressive revelation to who he is as Jesus. The Old Testament, every event, this is going to blow your mind right now, every event, every significant moment, every ritual, every, every covenant, every hero are all foreshadowing, pointing and lifting up the, the, the king who would come in his kingdom named Jesus. 
I thought about doing a series called Jesus in the Old Testament where we just look at like, oh, the Old Testament temple points to Jesus. Oh, the Old Testament covenants points to Jesus. Oh, the Old Testament, and just go on and go on and go on because Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is. The scripture says in Colossians, he's a visible picture of the invisible God. When you read the Old Testament, Hebrews says you only see a glimpse of God. You only, see a, you only see a shadow, it says in Hebrews, of who God is. You ever see a movie, like one of those movies, I can see those movies where um, it, it takes a whole bunch of team of people to rob a bank or rob a casino. Have you guys seen those movies? Why do I like to watch those movies and cheer on bad guys? I don't know. But there's the story, like Ocean's Eleven, you know what I mean? There's all these guys. That you, got, you got the guy who works over here on the bombs, and you got the guy over here who's good with like the, the, the you know, the, the explosives or the wires, you know what I mean? They got the, you got the tech guy, you know? You got the really small guy who can fit in small places. You know what I'm talking about? You got this like little team. I saw one of those movies recently where they're robbing a bank, okay? They're robbing a bank, and I'm watching it in the movie theater, my buddy, and there's this moment that happens with this guy that just seems out of character. Watch this. Seems out of character with the guy in the story of what I know about this guy. Do you, are anybody else uh, talkers in the movie? I'm a talker in a movie. I'm the worst. I'm a worst. I'm so glad my wife puts up with me. But I'm sitting there, and I'm watching, right? And this weird moment happens, and I'm like, hmm, that's, a, that's puzzling. That's weird. Why would he do that? Why would he say that? I start elbowing my buddy. I'm like, dude, there's, hey, there's something going on here. Something going on with this, this guy. This guy's Frank. This guy, Frank. It's not what he seems. He's not what he seems. And he's like, shut up. I'm like, just watch. Just watch. So <laughs> later at the end of the movie, Frank turns out to have way more depth, way more dimension to his character. And when it all comes together, all the pieces, it's like, oh, Frank was the guy the whole time. All of that makes sense now that I've read the ending. Now that I've seen the ending, it makes sense. The Bible is not like a cookbook. It's like a detective novel. It's like, here's what God, and it's these little hints, it's these little glimpses of God's heart, and you get to see Jesus, and oh, it makes sense. That's who God is. When you see it in context, you see that Jesus does display the compassion and the justice of God. Because only Jesus, and nobody saw this coming. What did Jesus do when he rose from the dead? The first thing he did, walking down the road to Emmaus, he looks at his, his disciples and he goes, hey, let's open up the scriptures and let me point to you all the places in the Old Testament that actually revealed me. And when they read it, it says their hearts burned. Like, oh my gosh, how did we miss this the whole time? The enemy didn't see it. Our carnal minds couldn't see it. The, the scripture says God uses the foolishness of this world to confound the wise. We didn't see it till the Holy Spirit called our name. Are you with me? But Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. God, in his compassion, looked at the violent human condition, looked at the depravity <laughs> that we are without his love, our propensity to just continue hurting people and being wicked and pulling further away from him and his ways. He looked at that. And in one final act of violence, I actually brought one picture from the Lego Bible that I think I like. In one final act of violence. Let's put that picture on the screen. He took all that violence upon himself. Are you seeing it now? So that nothing will come in the way of us and eternity with him. He uses the Old Testament. He meets them where they are. He points them to Jesus. He gets us to a place where we can see, oh, the sacrifices? Well, maybe God didn't invent a sacrificial system. Maybe, maybe there was tribes all over the place sacrificing to God. But have you ever heard of a substitutionary atonement? Have you ever heard about the lamb that was slain? The lamb that would step in, the perfect and unspotted lamb, the one that would come before Jesus on the cross? is a substitutionary atonement, meaning the, the death that he dies, the punishment that he takes. Friends, Jesus never did anything to deserve that. That's what we deserve. Atonement, meaning God's compassionate, 
but he's just. I didn't say God was fair. Some of you right now are like, that's not fair. That's not fair that Jesus would take my sin. That's not fair. It's not fair. God never said he was fair. I gotta be honest with you, I don't want God to be fair. I don't want God to be fair. Because if God was fair, I'd be in a lot of trouble. How about you? I want Jesus, and I'm so grateful for this, to step into my place and say, you don't deserve this, but because I am compassionate, I am slow to anger, I am gracious, but still not compromising the truth. God has found a way for Jesus to step in willingly, take on all that violence in one final act, a substitutionary atonement to a relationship with God forever. John 3.16 doesn't get better than this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, come on, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. What is God like? Well, if you have faith to believe, He is who He said He is, and He's always been that. And His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But our perspective, looking at it from the place in history where Jesus shows us the fullness of God, we see that only God could come up with a solution, a red plan of redemption that would be both compassionate and just. He'd have to do it himself for us. He'd have to do it himself. And where does that leave us today? How does this impact our life? Well, does, does the fire, does the reality of of a God who loves us that much, does that begin to maybe just change the molecules in your body, the DNA in your spirit? Is there something about the reality of a God who loves us that much? Is this something, does that motive, does that compel you? To ch does that compel you in any way? I mean, I got here this morning at like, early this morning and I, I walk up, I was gonna pray, I was gonna pray through these chairs and pray for all of y'all before you got here. And I walked back outside and my friend Sean was standing outside, and Sean was the guy you saw in the video earlier, and, uh, and uh, he's waiting to get let in, and I, I walked out, and I'm like, what's up, Big Daddy? I call him Big Daddy. Um, he's like, what's up, Pimp Magic? He calls me Pimp Magic. I don't know. So what are you doing here so early? And he gave me that look like, same thing I've been doing for two years. <laughs> If Sean doesn't serve every week, he probably serves every other week. He gets here early. He goes, hey, I brought two guys today. I'm going to be training them up on how to work in the production booth. He works in the music industry. He's produced records and worked with artists that you would know if he's professional. And he uses his gifts to further God's kingdom, to further God's plan, the church. And he gets here and he does that so that we can have a presentation for the gospel and make this available online so people can hear. He does all that because there's something in him that's changed. And I said, I said, well, what are you doing here? And he goes, man, when I was trying to be my own boss, I didn't like who I was becoming. But ever since I started serving, I've liked myself a lot more. <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is God like? Oh, he is like he says he is. He's compassionate. He's good. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's... It's wonderful, but he's also just, and we see that in Jesus. And you know what? That should scare us a little bit, but it should also draw us to him. It should, it should bring an honor and a respect and a reverence and a to who God is, but at the same time, it should actually bring us in a little closer. And how does that impact us today? Well, come on, can you see it yet? Can you see that Jesus is the greater Joshua? delivering us, 
from our enemies and delivering us in to freedom? Can you see that Jesus is the promised land? That Jesus brings into a relationship with God and with others that could never be possible without his Holy Spirit? Can you see that he's a greater Joshua? Can you see that he's the greatest promised land? Can you see that all the enemies that you're ever going to fight, whether it's your own mentalities or ways of thinking or your own shame or your own whatever it is, your own religion that you made for yourself or your own consequences, whatever those enemies are, can you see that Jesus is the better Joshua and he slays our enemies for us? And when he hangs on the cross and he declares, it is finished, he means it's over. Can you see that the, the Old Testament was just warming us up to be able to comprehend the greatness of a God that we probably wouldn't understand without seeing the whole story? Will you stand to your feet all over the building? How do you respond to this? How do you respond? I talked to my, my buddy yesterday. Lost a family member. He's talking on the phone. It's real for him. He just went through this, and he's processing, and he said, I don't know if I'm ever going to see her again. And I said, well, do you believe God is just? And he said, absolutely. So, well, there you go. The question isn't if we believe the Bible. The question is, do we trust him? The question is, do we believe Jesus? The question is, do we trust him? And that moves us to a response and that's to serve. That's to serve. That's to make Matthew 5 and that sermon a reality for people. It's to live a life that demands an explanation. It's to be the church. You know, normally we would go back and do a song right here, but I want you to do something. Will you take your phone out? Will you take your phone out? We have a new church phone number, and I want to put it on the screen for you. You can save this number. It's 831-777-FRDM or uh, 3736, 831-777-3736. It's a, a new church phone number we have. And we're trying to have an amazing Easter. We believe that there are people that are hurting and broken and looking for hope all over our city. Many of them are the friends and family that you're going to invite that day, but I think there's thousands more even that are looking for hope in this time, looking for a God who is compassionate, he is gracious, He's just. And if you text that number, text Dream Team to that number, we'll get a conversation going with you because we're going to do four Easter services on Easter morning. And I was talking to my team. And you know what that means? That means we need like hundreds of new parking spots. We're going to need to park people down the street and have like shuttles, right? We're going to need people driving shuttles, okay? It means we're going to have an Easter egg hunt for kids, 3,000 Easter eggs. We're going to need people helping with all the little kids getting the Easter eggs. We're going to have all sorts of stuff going on that day. And our job is to be the church. This is an all hands on deck day. You understand right now in this moment, if you have the faith to believe, what God has done and wants to do in you and through you. Can we make space for other people to experience this? Can we serve and create an environment for other people to experience this together? I want to pray for you. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes with me? Lord. We pray for anybody here today who's never said yes to Jesus, who's never said yes to your love, who's never said yes to who you say that you are, demonstrated in the person and the work of Jesus, and so evident on the cross. Lord, I pray that in this moment, anybody in this room would have the courage that your spirit would work in them. I, I pray that you would give them the courage to respond today and say yes to your love. If that's you, and today you want to say yes to Jesus, would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand declaring, I'm with you, I'm with you. There's hands going up all over the room. What you're saying, you're saying, I'm not going to live my life like that anymore. I'm going to ask God for help. I'm going to receive the Holy Spirit. I'm going to receive forgiveness of God. I'm going to be, He is going to be my Lord. He is going to be my Savior, and we are going to be His church. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's sing this song one last time. Come on. Come on, let's sing this.